Christians cling to the Bible as the ultimate truth, but is this unwavering attachment more about addiction than faith? What if believers are addicted to the comfort of these ancient stories? So welcome back to Answers from Genesis. I'm Genesis, and Alan Bondar is with me again as we continue our show, Addicted to God, based on Alan's upcoming book, How to Kill God the Easy Way. So today we're in chapter six, and we're focusing on why Christians are so deeply attached to the Bible. Could it be that their faith in these old stories is more like an addiction to the comfort that they bring? We're going to dig into that right after Ellen tells us about what's happening next week. Yeah, October 30th, a free launch party for my book. Very excited about it. Uh, Jen's going to be hosting uh, from Answers from Genesis here, and um, and, uh, we're going to be having some great guests on. that are, that are really awesome. You're definitely going to be a part of this. Uh, it's from 5 to 8 p.m. Eastern time. Again, October 30th, uh, pre-launch. So that means it's a day before the book officially comes out. So we're going to be offering some really good prices, just like really good prices. The, the Kindle is like almost free. <laughs> and the, the soft cover is going to be 50% off. The hard cover is going to be selling at the book cover, soft cover price. You don't want to miss this opportunity to be a part of a really, really fun show, getting to know all kinds of people that were part of the process of putting this book out um, and also getting yourself some really good deals. And I would encourage you to get be there and, and at least get the Kindle because it will help Amazon put this book up a little bit further on the rankings to sell it and get as many people reading this book as possible. It's important that people have an opportunity to have their faith challenged and to see what it does in their worldview. All right. So we look forward to seeing everybody there and any comments that you guys put up live. um, Maybe we'll get a chance to answer them. We'll see. We've got a really jam packed show, but we love the interaction. So I hope we see every, see you there. All right. So Alan, are you ready to start the 30 minute timer today and talk about the Bible grip on Christians faith? I am ready. Let's do it. All right. So Christians rely heavily on stories from thousands of years ago to guide their faith. Creation, Noah, Adam, David, Moses, all these kinds of things, right? But could this attachment to the Bible be more than about addiction, than belief? So why do Christians keep tuning into these ancient, turning to these ancient texts, even when there's no modern evidence to back them up? I I think it's because... Since we don't actually, I, I, I guess I'm just going to say it like this because it's, it's, it's reality. Since we don't actually experience God, uh, because we don't actually see him doing the things that the Bible says he does, um, we keep tapping into the same old stories over and over again as our proof that God does these things. Well, you remember when Jesus, when God parted the Red Sea, that was amazing. And you remember when when Daniel was in the lion's den, God did not kill him, protect the life. And do you remember David? Oh, if I could just be a David. And even Peter, man, he walked on water. See, God's amazing. He does amazing things. We're always referencing the Bible stories, except for the times that we just kind of make up our own stuff and say God does it. But let's be honest. They're not Red Sea moments. <laughs> They're not lion's den moments. They're just... <laughs> testimonies of a random person that says something like, well, I had an out-of-body experience. Okay, you say you did, but where is the written word about it? Who, who else can prove or validate this? Like, Or, you know, I, I know that God protected me from the hurricane. Okay, or the hurricane just moved and had nothing to do with God. But there's no verification that that had anything to do with God. And even if it did, it's not like a miracle of God parting the Red Sea. I mean, come on, these, these versions are entirely different types of stories. Burning bushes and things like that. That doesn't happen. So the only way to continue to feed that belief that God is real and that these things actually happened is to continue to believe the same old stories over and over and over again. I had a friend, a friend who's, um, I don't know how much of a Christian she considers herself, but she she works at the church and you know you know ten, attends the church, I, I guess at, at times. But um, but I know one of the things that she said to me was like, she was like, I, I wish they would at least do something different at Christmas. Tell a different story. Just kind of get boring. It's the same old story every single year. It's like, how many times do I have to hear this same story? 
Well, the reason is because that story will never repeat itself. And it can't repeat itself because it wasn't possible the first time it happened. So it's not going to ever happen again. So we just, anyway, I'm belaboring it, but that's, that's, I think why. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, you know, Christians, so, when you were talking about hurricanes there briefly, um, as one of your examples, we just went through a couple of hurricanes when, as of the time that we are recording this. Um, we've just been through a couple really, really big hurricanes. And uh, you and I both talked about this on Facebook, and we had various interactions. And so I do think that this is kind of um, an important thing to bring up now. I think it's timely, right? So some, some Christians were praising God that he moved the hurricane in Florida, and yet hundreds of people still died in Florida, and way more people died in North Carolina. So were they praising God for all of the people that he actually killed when he moved that hurricane? Well, uh, so the way the way the response goes from Christians is, well, we don't praise God for the actual deaths and the actual destruction. We praise him for the good that God's going to bring out of it. Um, and so that's, that's the typical response. But, but, but I suppose, you know, the question I keep pushing back on is, but yet you praise God for the specific act of the non-destruction when it doesn't happen. Oh, God moved the hurricane out of the way and saved lives. We praise him for that. Not just the good that comes out of it, but we praise him for that. But even though God's also the reason it moved into the destructive path and destroyed lives and killed people, we don't praise God for that. We just praise him for the good that he's going to bring of that, which is a com completely conflicting concept. If you're going to praise God for one you got to praise him the exact same thing or the opposite because he's actually the one in control. And therefore, not only is he bringing good out of it, but if he's a good God, then that means the actual act itself was good. So you should be praising him for that. And no Christian that I've been able to talk to has been willing to tell me, oh, yeah, no, that God is good. No, they'll say God is good even in that moment, but they refuse to say praise the Lord for that. They refuse to tell their friends, praise God for destroying your home. This is a wonderful moment. God is good to you by destroying your home nobody talks like that and i suppose because i mean let's face it that'd be an asshole move so nobody wants to say that kind of stuff but if you really are all about glorifying god then shouldn't you be doing that even in those moments because that elevates the glory of god for what he actually did in that very moment yeah i you know i do think it it is a huge problem um that people don't quite think through because in the Bible, um, basically God controlled, um, you know, when he parted the waters, right? That was, he has control over the waters. Um, and then he, all the hurricanes and the volcanoes and the fires and the, you know, all the various weather type of things um, in the Bible, he controls those. So um, does he still control those today? And if he does, then are, you know, are Christians really paying attention to, you know, all of this, we have a, a lot of disaster um, happening, even just this year, right? So I, I do think that that's something that Christians need to seriously think through. And so when they're when they're looking at the Bible, there's no new revelation from God since the New Testament. So um, why do you think that Christians still rely? I mean, it's been two thousand years since God supposedly said a word, right? Why do Christians still believe all of this? Why do they rely on it? That was a different culture. It was a different country. It was a different everything, different time period. Everything about that was different. So why do Christians still rely on this for making decisions in their life today? The only answer I can give to that is indoctrination, brainwashing. Because, right? Jen, if you think about it, there's, there's no sense to basing your life on a 2000 year old book and, and, and more, you know, supposedly from, you know, 6,000 years ago, who knows, whatever, but it, that, we're basing our lives on ancient stories, ancient traditions, ancient teachings that have no bearing on our lives today. So why? Like there, there's no sense to it. And the only thing I can think of is I just, the Bible's true because the Bible says it's true. And, and so I just believe the Bible and there's, there's no sense to it. I mean, do you have maybe you have a better answer to that than I do? <laughs> no, I mean, uh, I I get in these conversations on on Facebook, especially often with people, and their their evidence is to quote something from the Bible. 
right? The fool says in his heart, there is no God, therefore you're a fool. That I get that a lot, right? Um, but their evidence is only the Bible. So let's take a look at what evidence that we do have. So we've got some old, old, uh, old Testament stories. So creation, Adam, Noah, Moses, uh, uh, David, Elijah, Daniel. We've got some of these really, you know, great Old Testament stories. Um, we go back to these over and over and over again. And then we've got all the stories of Jesus and all the miracles that he did and all that kind of stuff, right? What kind of evidence do we have for any of those stories? Abraham, I forgot Abraham. Well, well we, we don't. Uh, the only internal evidence that we supposedly have is that the Bible proves itself. And so, you know, the prophecies come true. And so therefore, because they happen just as they were prophesied, then therefore the whole Bible is true. So it's self-validating, basically. Um but I mean, that's not really evidence. That's just this book says this happened. And so because this book says it happened and, and then therefore it happened the way it said it happened, then therefore the book is true. And it's circular reason. There's no there's no logic to that. It's not, it's, it's not evidence. Um, but again, it comes down to the fact that we are brainwashed to believe the Bible is true. And as long as I believe the Bible is true, I'm going to fight tooth and nail to believe that the prophecy happened here and it was fulfilled here. There's no proof for that. There's no evidence for that. Um, scholarship doesn't, I mean, not, not non-Christian scholarship, I should say, doesn't really support any of these prophecies taking place prior to the events or anything like that. And if they were, there's no substantive evidence to show that the fulfillments weren't just piggybacking back into it and making up a fulfillment to say that it happened. They're all written stories. I mean, not we can't even validate that any of it ever even happened in real life. They're just stories from a Bible. How, how do we even know? I mean, sure, we know floods happened, but this flood, that particular one, I mean, as far as I know, Red Seas were never parted, but a flood's not a miracle. I mean, and also I wouldn't say it's a worldwide flood anyway. I mean, there's so many, so many problems to this whole thing. There's there 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 is there really is no evidence, Jen. At least not from what I can tell. Maybe, maybe you have a better answer to that. So when I was trying to, when I was still a Christian, I was trying to prove that the Bible stories were real. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> first of all, my, as I've said before, uh, my uncle and my dad were biblical archaeologists, and they led some of the biggest um, biblical archaeological expeditions. Um, and so that really was a big part of my life, right? So I had a, a study Bible on the archaeological study Bible. I think it's what it's called the archaeological study Bible, something like that, right? And it's so it showed all of these archaeological finds that matched up with certain verses in the Bible, and a big thick book, very very thick book. And I would I would just pour through that, just you know, trying to prove how all of these stories were true. And at the time that I read that, I believed it. I really believed that this piece of this little piece of pottery proves that the Israelites were wandering the desert for 40 years. <laughs> but finding a piece of pottery doesn't prove anything. It proves that somebody lived there so many years ago. It doesn't prove that this was these were, you know, Israelites wandering some desert. It just doesn't. So um just very briefly, um, you know, my uncle and my dad, they supposedly found Noah's Ark. They found Mount Sinai. They found the Pharaoh's chariot wheels in the Red Sea. And so they found all of these, you know, fantastic things. But if you think about it, a chariot wheel underwater, where a place where, which has a land bridge. So this land, there's a land bridge in the Red Sea, right? And so sometimes water covers it and sometimes water does not cover it. It depends on when the waters are high and when the waters are low, right? Kind of like when the tide comes in, the tide comes out, although it's more of a river type of thing. But um, anyway, if any chariot ever crossed that land bridge and it broke a wheel and that wheel was left behind for some reason, then it would be there. Does that prove that it belonged to Pharaoh? Does that prove that it belonged to Egypt? Does that prove that Egypt was chasing Israel 
across the Red Sea? Does that prove that God parted the waters in the Red Sea? Does that prove that there were a million Israelites going across and, and God protected them with this cloud so that the Egyptians couldn't see them? Does that prove any of that kind of stuff? Because there was a chariot wheel found in this place. No, it doesn't prove anything other than that somebody crossed that land bridge at some point. That's all it proves. That's all right. it proves. And when I look at everything in that biblical, in that archaeological study Bible, everything lines up that way. Yes, they can find uh, burn marks on Mount Sinai. Does that mean that was God that made the burn marks there? No. Doesn't mean that at all. Just means there's burn marks there, right? <laughs> there's So I could go on and on and on. There are all kinds of things in um, biblical and what we call biblical archaeology that just means that people used to live there. Well, we know people used to live there. I am not saying that Israelites didn't exist. They did. Israelites lived there. They lived in Israel, right? Um, whether they lived in Egypt is may or may not. Um, and, and that's, we're not going to get into all the details of that. But the Israelites did live there. So when we find pottery, <laughs> which is pretty common, right? From the Israelites, well, so what? We found pottery from the Israelites. Did the Israelites worship Yahweh? Yes, they did. So finding evidence that the Israelites worshiped Yahweh just means that we have evidence that the Israelites worship Yahweh. We don't have evidence that Yahweh existed. We don't have evidence that um, any of the major characters existed. We have no real evidence of them. So getting a little tiny detail and trying to tie it into a major story in the Bible without directly tying it in, it would never stand up in a court of law. And people will always ask me, you know, what's your standard for evidence? Does it stand up in a court of law? That's my standard. And I think right. that's a reasonable standard. What do you think? Oh, I think it's an absolutely reasonable standard. The argument is that, uh, or the response to this from Christians would be, yes, but what you're missing, Jen, is that cumulatively, they all point to God. So when you have so much cumulative evidence, <laughs> it's hard to ignore the fact that God exists because, yes, just one piece of pottery is not, but the wheel, the piece of pottery, the, the burn marks, the, the, the piece of wood on the ark, near, near where the ark supposedly was, all these things put together. Now we prove that God exists because you can't ignore all of these pieces of evidence. So taken to your analogy, okay, so let's let's put that in a court of law. Okay, great. Let's parallel us to, um, let's just say that um, we're on trial and uh, and you're being accused of murder. And, um, and so we have to decide who committed this murder. And the prosecuting attorney comes up and the prosecution says, well, your honor, I have all this evidence that a human being did this murder. There was a, a knife um, without even prints. There's, there was just a knife. Uh, there was there was a, a the, the, the body was found in the exact place they said it was. Uh, we even found a broken piece of pottery because there was a battle that took place in that uh, before that murder happened. And blah, blah, blah. They can have 16 pieces of whole body. And you see, Your Honor, this proves that a human being committed this murder. OK, well, was it Jen? Well, Your Honor, at this point, you just have to have faith. <laughs> it was Jen. But none, like nothing you just gave me had any substantive evidence for this particular case. Like all you did was prove to me that a human being did something, but you didn't prove to me that Jen did anything. That's not that's not sufficient unless you can take him all the way across the goal line. That's not evidence. That's not evidence for the case at hand. It's just evidence that something did something great. But how does that help the case at hand? The case you're trying to prove is that God exists. So all these pieces of evidence don't take you across the finish line. They only take you to a point that says, well, something happened. Great. But how does that prove God any more than the murder case proved Jen did it? Nothing. There is nothing there. So you can stack 16,000 pieces of evidence that take you nowhere. And that doesn't change zero to anything. It's all, they're all zero. They're all amount to zero. There's nothing there. So, if that's true, and we don't actually have any evidence for any of those stories, then how did these stories start? Where did they come from? 
Well, again, very hard to know precisely, but I would imagine much the same way we tell stories today. People have imaginations uh, and, and they, they record stories. I mean, we have comic books. You know, I can imagine 2,000 years from now, 6,000 years from now, same type of things. And boy, these superheroes, man, they had back then, they were really being, you know, they were amazing. <laughs> if you start to believe this stuff exists, you're going to come up with anything to prove that it was real. It, it just, it's imagination. People put stuff down. They record the stories. They had heroes, just like we have heroes. Um, maybe different types of heroes, but their heroes served a certain purpose. They demonstrated the God that they wanted to believe in. And and that's it. Simple as that. And so they compiled all this and, and it became a story. And of course, when you're telling a story, you, you attribute it to, you know, to different authors, whatever you got to do to make it sound more realistic and so and, and powerful. I mean, when you tell when you when you make a movie uh, today, the goal is to make it as realistic as possible. I mean, it's it's and, and so you leave it at that. And if people believe it, they believe it. But th your goal is not to like leave it as though it's not realistic. You want it to look realistic. That's the whole point. Yeah, there are some there are groups of people who literally believe Star Wars was real. Sure. Star Trek was real or even Harry Potter. And there are groups of people with those three examples who actually have debate groups on Facebook or whatever your, their social media is. Uh, and they debate the details of those stories as if they were real in the same way that Christians debate the details of the Bible, right? Mm -hmm. And so it is, um, it is definitely. So I do think that uh, there's an, another way that this got started. It just, uh, so... The Bible is actually one of the later versions of what I call mythology. So it used to be that we all understand that the Greeks had mythology, the Romans, the Egyptians, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, all these different uh, groups had their own mythology, right? So they came up with their own stories about what was happening to explain the weather, the weather is always a big factor in all of this, right? So when they had a big storm, then they would see, they would look up in the sky. They didn't have electricity back then. They looked up in the sky. They could actually see the stars. Not We can't do that today, mostly, for the most part, right? And they would see these constellations, and this looks like this kind of a character, right? And this character, this is happening at the time that I see this character. Therefore, this character is the god of war this character is the god of thunder and lightning this character is the god of you know messenger god whatever this character is the love god all of these kinds of things they name those characters right so they develop stories around what they saw in the sky in comparison to what was actually happening on earth at the time so it could be they were having a famine could be they were having a flood could be whatever it was that was happening these stories came about to explain because they didn't know how to explain why they don't have food this year, but they had food last year. They didn't know how to do that. And so all they could see what, was what they could see. And that was the sky, right? So it, it was the sun, it was the moon, and it was all the constellations that they could see. So they made these stories about them, right? And so each country had their own stories and some it, nations they called them back then, right? And each nation, um, sometimes they kind of borrowed stories from other nations, but um, back then uh, they didn't they didn't really care about borrowing gods. In fact, they were polytheistic, right? So they believed in many, many, many gods. So these are the gods that they saw in, in the skies. And so um, when they borrowed gods, they just add them to their pantheon of gods, right? And so they, they, they just grew and grew and grew. We had more and more gods and they love that, right? And so then Israel comes along and Israel is going to be different, right? They are, we're going to be bigger and better than everyone else. It kind of reminds me of Texas, right? So I just moved from Texas, so I can say that. We're going to be bigger and better than everyone else. So Israel, they borrow all these stories from other nations. They borrowed stories from Egypt, from Greece, from Rome, from Assyria, from Babylon, other, other stories as well, but those were the major ones, right? And they borrowed these stories, but what they didn't want to borrow was their gods, so they attributed all of these stories to their new God. So their new God was Yahweh, right? And so now at the beginning of the of the Bible, it's it's kind of hidden in your English version, but if you under if you know how to read Hebrew, at the beginning of the Bible, it's still polytheistic. There's still multiple gods that it's talking about, if you understand Hebrew. Um, 
they've hidden that in English, but it eventually they got to the point where we just want to have one God. And so that one God now became the God of all of these stories. But almost every story in the Bible has elements that were borrowed from other nations, from other gods. And that's how they started, right? And so then those became oral tradition. And that's why, for instance, on Passover, what the, what did they do on Passover? You tell the story. Every year, you tell the story. Every single year. That was what they were commanded to do, is tell the story every single year, so that it was passed on from generation to generation to generation. If you heard it every year for your whole life, it became a part of you. It's like Christmas every year for your whole life. It's a part of you. You know, whatever traditions that you have in your family, it's a part of you because you do the same thing over and over and over and over every single year or every week if you go to church, right? So that is really how all of these stories got started. And some of them needed to have a superhero. So instead of the superhero being Zeus or um, Hermes or, you know, whatever all of the gods were, then we named them Adam, Noah, Moses, David, Daniel. All right, so these were men instead of gods because Israel just wanted to have one God. So they set themselves apart to be different. And that's why theirs have, I think that's why the Bible has continued, whereas all the others, we kind of, we know that they're mythology, right? I now call the Bible Israel's book of mythology. That's what I call it, because that's exactly what it is. Mm -hmm. So they wanted to be different. And that's how Israel set themselves apart to be different. Yeah, no, I, I agree entirely. I think that's a really well well explained um, situation. That's precisely the way I see it. I, I love that. That's good. Um, you know, so humanity using imagination came up with gods. Israel borrowed from all those, used their imagination, developed it even more, made it better, stronger, made their God the best. Um, you know, and, and then, of course, along comes Jesus and they figured out a way to round it out nicely. And, you know, bada bing, bada boom, you have a completed story. And, I mean, who knows if they ever thought that this thing was going to take off as a real religion, but good Lord, somehow it just happened, and here we are. <laughs> you know, even the Jews, um, if you read some of the Jewish literature today, um, many Jews believe that the Old Testament stories are simply myth, and that they're just a good way of telling about the God. So some Jews believe there is a literal God, but many Jews don't believe there is a literal God. Many Jews are actually atheists, um, which is very interesting, right? Yeah. So they are not, uh, I think Christians uh, believe the Old Testament stories, which are really the Jewish stories, more than Jews do for the most part. Now, obviously, it's not across the board, but for the most part, it is, right. and, which is, which is, all right, so that's it's something and we may not be able to answer this but you know how did christians take this so literally when even the jews who the ones who were supposedly involved in these stories and writing these stories and they did not right they knew that they were just stories right yeah no for sure it, it is it is mind blowing i, I again i it, christianity became a religion and so they found a way to manipulate the masses by finishing out the story well with Christ being, you know, the, the final finisher, so to speak of, of God's story. He's the final superhero, if you will. And so Christianity arises from that and kind of abandons Judaism and becomes its own entity. It becomes a heart salvation instead of a circumcision salvation, you know? So, so that's best I can explain of how it became more of a Christianized religion. Um, but, you know, of course, there's the Jew Jewish version that still exists in, in much the same way you said. And, um, and then there's even the Islamic version of it. And every, you know, there's several different versions and they all come from the same story. Yep. Um, Christians are just more New Testament version believers. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, the way we started today, you know, was, was asking the question, you know, what's, what's the evidence, what's the proof for all this. And, and really, I mean, as, as, as an atheist now, I am not compelled to prove to you that the Bible isn't true. I'm not compelled to prove that God doesn't exist because there's no evidence to begin with that needs to be disproven. Um, but I'm acquiescing and doing my best to help unravel some of the beliefs that you have that you think support your beliefs because really there are none. In, in the words of Christian, Christopher Hitchens, the late Christopher Hitchens, I love, I love this quote. 
He said that which can be asserted without evidence can be dismissed without evidence. Mm. And it's a great quote because it's absolutely true. I mean, if you give me nothing, why should I have to prove that it's not true? That's just silly. But that's the best argument Christians have anymore. Well, fine, we can't prove. You can't prove he doesn't, so therefore he does. What? <laughs> right. So, um, yeah, that's a, a logical fallacy at its best, right? So um, I, I do know that I think... I will say that the best evidence that there is no God is that there is no evidence. There's just right. no evidence. There's no, not. Exactly. It's not like we have a little bit. You know, if we had a little bit, this would not even be a conversation. Well, yeah, but they're going to argue there is a little bit. But my point is, you, and, and I think you're saying this, at least there's a little bit to take you past the goal line. Something that doesn't require faith. Right. But there's no evidence directly for God. Is there any evidence... Well, I was going to ask another question, but there's our timer. So just like with any addiction that you need to quit, once the brainwashing has been removed, you just pick a time and you stop. That's right. And uh, don't leave just yet. I want to encourage you to subscribe, like, and drop a comment here. And if you want to join our fast-growing community of ex-Christians on Facebook, click the link in the description below. And please don't forget to join us on October 30th for our pre-release launch party. We're very excited to see you there and hang out with all the guests. Yes, definitely. Now, if you found value in this week's discussion, you can drop a tip in the tip jar if you want. We'll be back next week, continuing to peel back the layers of religious addiction. So until next time, question your faith with answers from Genesis.